while there was a really interesting uh, template there, and this, with the Montevideo one as well. But there's been some talk going on about, well, what would it look like if there was a transition enabling act? If you had something that was about accelerating all of this stuff, like we had in 1936, 1937, that was uh, the legislation that, for example, enabled this country to turn its food system around uh, so quickly. Um, and one of the things that Transition Network's been involved with, which looks like it might uh, be, be, uh, be successful, is uh, changing the government's feed-in tariff review so that it looks at community-owned and community-run installations differently from, from commercial ones. Because that uh, the Lewis power station wouldn't be possible anymore now, because the feed-in tariff for that size of installation has now been pulled or reduced to an extent that that scheme wouldn't be viable. But what we're saying is, well, uh, actually, if it's owned by a community, it should be looked at completely differently than a commercial farm on farmland in, in Cornwall, for example. Uh, that idea of a learning network as well, so Transition Network and through the website that we have, is very much designed to try and almost take Transition Network out and enable everything to, to, to talk to itself. And that's a really useful resource. So if you're not involved in Transition yet and you want to find out about it, on transitionnetwork.org you can search it by initiatives, by projects, by people, uh, and you can really get a flavour of, of what's going on there. And then also looking at in, uh, about how we bring investment into this. If we're serious about uh, this idea of, of localization as economic development and the enterprises and the, the things that we'll need for that, how do we bring the investment in for that? Uh, and so we're looking very actively at, at what uh, social investment would look like coming into that uh, and how trans what sort of support transition groups need to move from having an idea to being uh, ready for that investment to, to, to come in. And something that I think we really want to do over the next year or so in Transition Network as well is, is, to, is to look more at this idea of localization uh, in the same way that uh, the things that, 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 that uh, are really, whose days are really numbered, uh, the sort of the current way of doing things do. So at the moment, when we, localization tends to be something that's a bit of a fringe kind of an idea. Uh, but there was a famous model that was done in climate change, the climate wedges, which said at the moment, we've come up like this, now we're here, we need to be down here, we need a path that goes like that, but our current aim is we're going to carry on going up like that. So we're not going to get from there down to there just using one thing. It'll be made up of a series of things. So they argue, well, nuclear power is one, and energy conservation is one, and electric cars is one. I think intentional localization it would be a huge one of those. But what we've never done is actually try and quantify that. How many jobs would it create? How much more money would it bring into local communities? Uh, how much other spin-offs would it have in terms of training and skills and so on? And I think that, that that's going to be a really important piece of work. So the question that I, I posed at the beginning was really uh, about the extent to which we could argue that, that, that when things get really tricky and when change starts to happen very, very rapidly, um, we could look that transition might be one of the things that would, would be on the table. And at the Transition Network Conference in Liverpool, it was really interesting to get a taste of, of seeing some of that in practice. So for example, there were some, there was some people from Brazil who are doing transition in Brazil. Amazing what's happening over there. They've got very active stuff happening in, in the very wealthy neighborhoods in Brazil, in the middle class suburban neighborhoods, and also in the favelas in Sao Paulo. They had the first unleashing of a transition initiative in one of the favelas in Sao Paulo last December. And um, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, yeah. And so there was, they, they've been doing transition training all over the place in Brazil. And there was a floods recently where there was a town that was washed down a hillside. And the, there were three transition trainings going on in the towns nearby there. And they offered free places to anybody from, from that community who wanted to come on the transition training. As a result of which now, transition is one of the key things they're using for the rebuilding and the redesigning of that uh, place. Uh, in New Zealand, uh, there was a woman who came up recently at a talk I did who was from New Zealand, who was talking about after the earthquakes in different places in New Zealand, how the work that the transition groups have been doing for the previous three or four years uh, became really, really useful in that. The time banks they'd set up, the networks they'd created and so on, became really a key part of the, uh, of, of, of the revival of those places and, and their response to that in those very difficult times. And in Spain, where they've almost had a, a revolution going on there for the last six months or so in the occupying of lots of the squares, the public squares uh, across Barcelona and various other places, that the, 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 the transition group in Barcelona, for example, were very active in that. Uh, and growing food in the piazzas and, and helping in that sort of organizing process. So when we started doing transition four or five years ago, I imagined it as an environmental process, that it was about carbon reduction and so on. But now, really after, after all this time, 
uh, I see it as a cultural process. And it's really about what does it, what kind of culture do we need in place to be most able to respond and to flex uh, and to see that as, as something that's really positive. <clears throat> and it's something that I very much see starting to happen uh, in Totnes now in terms of the story the place starts to tell about itself and what other people come there to see. Um, so uh, um, just my couple of little plug bits. So this is, this is, I've only got a few of these, if you want one of these, this is what's called a BLAD, Book Layout and Design. It's something the publisher do as a little taste of the book. But this is the, the, the transition companion that will be out at the beginning of October. There'll be a launch in Totnes on the 4th of October, and there'll be one in London sometime. Uh, and if you want to find out more about Transition Network, there's some leaflets here. And if you want to find out about Transition Network, again, it's transitionnetwork.org. Um, and that's about all I have to say. So. Um, does anybody have any questions or reflections or thoughts? Yes? Yeah, was just, um, and there's a huge agenda, and um, I know transition is about doing things practically locally, um, but I, I work for an Agenda 21 initiative, and we've worked over a number of years on policy, and it's just things like um, you know, the new national planning framework. Uh, uh, and these sorts of concepts which you're talking about, it. Um, it would be really good if they were incorporated in these kind of documents. And I'm just wondering what work the Transition Town Network is to, you know, working with government perhaps on trying to just put these ideas into the into what are you know major documents will have a huge impact on our community. Yeah. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I, I think the honest answer to that is not much because we are a very small team, and uh, we. Um, we do an enormous amount as a very small team, and actually there's a lot of areas that we could be really dragged, you know, inputting into those kind of policy things. Uh, there are some areas where, where those things just kind of self-organize and some people will go forward and do that. And, uh, but we haven't done much, to be honest, but it's, it's an area where we should. But I think, I think as well what we try and hope is that, is, is that some of those things... I suppose what was interesting with those stories like in New Zealand and places was it's the extent to which maybe transition thinking will kind of get into the drinking water and into the DNA at, at, at the appropriate time. And, uh, uh, and so maybe rather than us pushing it, maybe we start to see that sometimes. But there's always things, yeah, absolutely, that, should, that stuff should be in there. But very often though, those things are still very uh, t tied to the kind of when we get back to economic growth kind of angle. And uh, one of the things that we did in, in Totnes last year was an energy the energy descent plan for Totnes, which was our kind of plan B for the area, based on assuming that that's not the case, uh, which would hopefully have lessons for that kind of planning as well. Um. There's a lot of organisations that probably have far less uh, members than you do um, in the Transition Town movement and yet they're lobbying on a constant basis. Um, is that something that you're looking to do or you're currently doing? Um, because obviously until we get it sort of change high up, it's certainly in places like London, it's going to be rather ineffective. Well, I think our sense is, is, that, is that, there, that there are different ways to make that happen. I think you, you, could, you could just focus on policy change. And I know a lot of people who work just in the area of policy change. And some of them lose the will to live quite rapidly. I think I think our our angle is actually if if what you can do is create that, you know, like the Trash Catchers Carnival, like the Brixton Pound, like those things which which are really powerful stories and which spread all over the place and which are replicable. Anybody could pick them up and do them in other places. And you and, and you get a sense of uh, you get a sense of what's possible. I suppose that that, that what transition tries to do is to make the unelectable electable and try and change the kind of the story about what's actually possible. And I think that we can do that as effectively by just being where we are and doing what we're doing and being very and doing things that are very bold and brave and brilliant and beautiful and getting on with it. Uh, and I think that actually if that's all linked up and those stories are told, that it starts to feed into that kind of policy process. Maybe I'm terribly naive, but certainly that seems to me what I see happening in different places, that it starts to, uh, it always feels to me like, like, like policy and stuff is kind of a bit frozen, because given the scale of climate change and so on, there's a massive amount that needs to happen, but that local politicians feel 
paralyzed to do stuff because they don't feel they've got the, the mandate or the permission to do it. And then communities say, well, they aren't doing anything, so why should we? So transition tries to kind of oil those wheels in that sense. So you, you believe in telling those stories and letting it spread that way? Yeah. Well, are you looking at other things other than just the books, the publications, other forms of communicating this to the broader public? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we do. Uh, uh, there's, there's lots of stuff that we do online and there's films, we're making a new version of the transition film that we did and we try and pull all those stories together uh, every month. If you, if you, so there's an on transition culture and it goes out in the bulletin as well that Mike does the, the, the transition network newsletter that you sub can subscribe to. We do a kind of uh, uh, a story of, we gather together all the stories every month of different things that are happening. It's really a very inspiring look at what's happening all around the world. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of our role, really, I think, Transition Network, is to draw those stories in and put them back out again in a range of different ways. Um, I just wanted to respond uh, of what you were saying about kind of national uh, agendas and, and put in for the local agendas, like I'm part of Transition Crouch End, and um, so I was invited to go to the House of Parliament to, to contribute to the discussions for food security. And so um, I went along there, and mostly the speeches were about GMO and, uh, and stuff, the lead, lead speakers. But I um, spoke about what we needed to do locally, and, and they were, the response was, well, what can London do? How can London possibly feed itself? And we've got lots and lots of growing projects there and community projects as part of um, Transition Crouch End. But uh, ultimately, the, what, what our solution was, because we didn't have the land there, was to start up a CSA with um, a farm that was 15 minutes by train into Hertfordshire. So we've de developed a CSA with them there. And, you know, um, the, the parliament in, it, well, the, the group of parliament were saying, well, what we need to do is we need to learn what you're doing and replicate it and provide you with funding and everything. And they haven't. but. In a way, to me, that, that shows the importance of transition is developing locally. We're totally resilient without waiting for them. You know, I mean, it's great. It would be great if they turned around and said, yes, they would do this and they would provide it. But actually, we're doing all right. You know, we're feeding the community, those who want to um, join in with it. So I just say get on with it locally and make yourself strong and resilient. Um, so you can yeah, I think it's very much about not waiting for permission in that sense. And I remember in Stroud, Stroud Transition Stroud were working very closely with, uh, with, with, with the council there. And the guy who was the head of the council said, if Transition Stroud didn't exist, we'd have to make them up. You know, that they, they could really see the importance of that sort of fertile, bubbling, creative, active, uh, solutions-focused thing in, being in place. And as well, if there's other people here from different transition groups, if you want to chip in any of your experience, please do. Uh, hi, does the uh, uh, Transition Network have any examples of engaging older retired people who, who um, probably have got the time, because I mean we've got a, we have a hub in, in, in Wells, but, you know, we're going to get a limited amount of time, we've tried to engage uh, with these people and it hasn't really, these people, sorry, hasn't really worked. Um, with older and, people? With, yeah, with older people and, and they're a bit sceptical of something which they think it's like it's newfangled and uh, I was actually shouted at by one couple and said we actually quite like living in a box on our own, thank you very much when we were going around offering free, we were offering free surveys on fuel poverty and I was screamed out at the door saying keep your minds out of our business in this village sort of thing. That was only one example but we had a, a network of volunteers to do, to, to, to do energy assessments because you know there's some people there who are really serious fuel poverty in Somerset who live on their own. Um, has there been any ways of, of engaging this demographic if you, if you like? Well I think it's, it's, it's funny because actually in some places one of the criticisms people make of transition is well, I went to a meeting, there was lots of grey hair there, <laughs> you know, and so in some places, actually, if you're trying to do, I mean, tr tr transition, it's, it's interesting, in terms of, de of a demographic, there's something about that early stage of transition where it needs people who've got time, who've got certain skills, uh, you know, you need to be able to do a press release or make a poster or, uh, you know, feel confident doing that kind of thing. And I think as well, it's that people need to have in, in that early stage, needs the, if, if the, their experience of life is, well, you push to make something happen and something happens. 